we had a, par- a portion of Torah, two verses, and I'm going to pop it up there because it ties into this week's message. Um, I couldn't get to last week's. So I know some of you are like, oh, just go for it. You know, I just want to tell you something. In this, in this modern age that we live in with technology and people with clickers and people being able to handle like five-second messages, very few people can sit for 50 minutes any longer. It's, it's, they're not able to concentrate. And it's really hard when you're watching at home because when you're home, you could pause it. You can go to the bathroom. You can get a, something to eat. It's really hard. It's not the same. Here, you know, you can't really do that. But I'm here to tell you that it is very hard. You'll get experts that say, you're crazy to try to speak that long. You're crazy to try to speak that long. But by the same token, my take is, how do you watch a ball game for three hours and not move? How do some of your kids play video games for five, seven hours and not move? How do you get engrossed in a movie? Or surf the net for hours and hours trying to find out some nonsensical information? So don't tell me you can't do it. You just choose what you want to focus on. Everybody can focus. So I'm not buying that. I'm not modernizing it. Well, you just can't do that, Rabbi. First of all, no expert is going to tell me what I can do and what I can't do. I'm going to listen to God. Genesis 25, 22, 23. The children, that was Jacob and Esau, fought with each other inside her so much. That would be Rebecca. She said, if it's going to be like this, why go on living? You know, who? listen, that's crazy. Your kids are fighting inside the womb. What's it going to be like when they get out? So she went to inquire of the Lord. She's a God-fearer, so she wants to find out, you know, God, what's going on? He's a good person to ask, usually, not your peers. And he answered her, there are two nations in your womb, not just two kids. And from birth, from birth, they will be rival people. One of these peoples will be stronger than the other, and one was, but the older will serve the younger. So, you know, Rebecca has this situation. She goes to the Lord, and the Lord tells her, rival nations. We know this, being on the other side of this, it's Edom and Israel. These are the descendants, the Edomites and the Israelites. Jacob, uh, those that are descended from Jacob were the Israelites, and obviously those that descended from Esau was the Edomites, and they were rivals. Kill Chronicles. He also told her that the older would serve the younger, which goes against everything biblically. It goes against the law of the firstborn in in Deuteronomy 21, and it goes against that whole culture. But the revelation, obviously, is preparing us that we're going to hear a lot from Jacob, and he's going to be in the messianic line. That family line is going to serve Messiah and serve us. But always, normally, in this culture, in Middle Eastern culture, always younger brothers were subservient to the firstborn male. Whether, whether, we, whether we look at Deuteronomy 21, the culture, Middle Eastern culture, that's the way it was. So this is like a reversal. It's not what we expect. God's reversing what's natural. But because everything God does is supernatural, he's entitled to reverse anything natural he wants. He could suspend the sun. Didn't he? That's Josh. So what we're talking about in theological circles, and a lot of you are Probably more study than I am. I don't study a lot. I spend a ton of time with God listening to his voice, but I don't spend a ton of time in books and commentaries. I don't really have time for that. I just don't. Too busy. (laughs) Too busy. But we're talking about God's sovereignty. You've heard that word, right? God is sovereign. Sovereignty. You've heard it, especially in evangelical circles. You know, you won't hear too much in charismatic circles because they can't even spell it. No, I'm not saying that. I'm only kidding. Relax. Some of his charismatic say, come on, I could spell that. Uh, so the concept of sovereignty is further explained in our New Testament reading. We couldn't get to it because that reading is so thick, and you're going to see. And um, I hope some of you did your homework. It would have been much easier if you would have done your homework because then you would have been prepared, and then you would have had thoughts already, and it would have, you know, cemented it. But, okay, here goes. Here's the New Testament reading from last week that we didn't get to, Romans 9, 10 through 15. And it goes like this. And even more to the point is the case of Rivka. So he's going back to what we read in the Old Testament. Paul is going back to the Torah. He said, for both her, for, for both her children, excuse me, were conceived in a single act with Yitzchak, Isaac, our father. And Paul's saying our father because it's your, it's, your, it's your heritage. 
you, whether you're grafted in or not, now you're part of the olive tree. You're in. You know, you're not a Gentile branch. You're just a branch. And you're in, so you're part of this heritage. It's your heritage. You know, you've been adopted, basically. It's your heritage. It just is. Before they had done anything at all, okay, before they were even born, before they did anything, they're, they're not even out. Either good or bad, so that God's plan might remain a matter of his sovereign choice. There's the word. Not dependent on what they did, but on God, who does the calling. A lot of people have a hard time with this. This is why people don't really believe in God unless it's convenient. You know, everybody wants a Savior when they're drowning. Nobody wants a Lord when they get on shore. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger, and this accords to where it is written, Yaakov I loved, but Esau I hated. People have a very hard time with this. We'll work it out. So are we to say it is unjust for God to do this? Question mark. Heaven forbid! Exclamation mark. For to Moshe, Moses, he says, quote, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will pity whom I pity. So we got to break it down, obviously. We read six verses of Scripture. There's no way, a lot of context, but there's no way you're going to really get the meaning without breaking it down. That's just the process. So let's, let's process. Romans 9, 10, it says, and even more to the point, in the case of Rivka, for both her children were conceived in a single act with Yitzchak, our father. So Paul is just bringing us back to the story of Jacob and Esau, giving us an example of God's sovereignty. He's tying it together. And I'm telling you, a good Jewish believer in Messiah like Paul was, Paul was a good Jewish believer in Messiah, they have an ability to take the Old and the New Testament and make it a universe. Sadly enough, don't, get, don't take this one way. I know there's a lot of Gentile scholars, but they do a phenomenal job with the Gospels, and rabbis do a phenomenal job with the Torah, but very few kind of connect the dots. And when they connect the dots, it becomes high def. There's no question about it. So let's look at 9-11, because that's the way you're supposed to read the Bible. It's a, it's a universe, a universe. 9-11, it says, and before they were born, before they had done anything at all, either good or bad, so that God's plan might remain a matter of his sovereign choice, not dependent on what they did, but on God who does the calling. So a pronouncement was made. It was declared before the children were born. This pronouncement that God made could not, therefore, have anything to do with the works of the children. Good, bad, or indifferent. It had nothing to do with them. It didn't matter. It was entirely a matter of God's choice based on God's own will and not on the character or the accomplishment of the boys. To me, this is incredible assurance. It gives me tremendous security, really, that God's promise is going to be fulfilled and it depends solely on his will and nothing else. Like people go, well, wh what, if, what if Moses didn't stop at the burning bush? I, I can't totally answer that, but somebody else would have. You follow? What if Ruth didn't? Then the book would have been called Jessica. I don't know. <laughs> but my point is, without being a wise guy, that God's will will hold. God is not dependent on us. We are thoroughly dependent on him. And if we decide to say no to him, it's still going to get done, sweet pea. Don't be that impressed with yourself. It's a mistake. It's a mistake. What are my kids going to do without me? They'll figure it out. You know why? Because God is good. That's why. 9.12, it says, It was said to her, the, young, the older will serve the younger. The older will serve the younger. So this was God's decision. It was said to her, from God, you got twins, you're going to have twins, and the older one will be subservient to the younger. Esau was the firstborn. He gets the honor associated with it. But God. But God. I mean, how many plans did you have? My plan was simple. I was absolutely going to be single. I was absolutely not going to be saved and have nothing to do with God. I was absolutely going to have a million dollars by the time I was 30, which I was almost there. And I had an investment offshore that was going to give me 10%. And I was going to live on the beach off 100 grand a year and party my proverbial brains out. How did I do? 
This is the furthest thing from a party. I got news for you. If that was my dream, this is my nightmare. I'm just kidding with you. It's not a nightmare. It's just a really bad dream is what it is. Um, so, so how can this be? How, really, how can this be? This goes against everything that's normal and natural. We like normal and natural. How can it be? God's sovereignty. That's one of the themes of Romans 9 through 11. Those three chapters is that God works, you know, people say God works in mysterious ways. God works in surprising ways. It's not mysterious, it's surprising. So that no one could ever presume upon his grace. You can't be presumptuous when it comes to God. You can't go, well, if I do this and don't do that, I'm going to get that. So let's look at a few Old Testament scriptures, some of my favorite, that dictate God's sovereignty. So you don't think it's just something that Paul is dictating in Romans in this theological book to a bunch of Gentiles who are new to the faith. God's sovereignty didn't start in Romans 9, okay? Um, The Psalms are a great place to go because the Psalms are heartfelt. They speak for us. They they express things that that we want to express, that we don't know how to express. You know what I mean? The Bible speaks to us. The Psalms speak for us. It's a whole different ballgame. So let's look at Psalm 115.3. It says, our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. That's, a, that's very difficult for somebody to deal with. You know, if a human being says, look, man, I, I'm going to do whatever I want. You understand? And you just got to deal with it. You can almost say to them, do you think you're God? But when God says, I'm going to do whatever I want, you could say to them, do you think you're God? And he'll say, yeah. This is hard for us to accept because human beings by nature are rebellious. They don't like authority. You got to almost put them in the military and force it on them. You got to break them during boot camp. But you can't break people today because they do whatever they want. Ask anybody who's my age, 63, who has a business. How easy is it to find people that are subservient to work for you and, and, to, and, to, and to go the extra mile? Guys, I don't know if you've noticed this, but in the Bible, the term self is only used in a derogatory fashion. It's only used when you're supposed to deny yourself, when you're supposed to present yourself a sacrifice, and when you're supposed to consider others greater than yourself. Ain't that something? It's not natural, is it? No, it's natural for us to consider ourselves before others. It's natural for us not to deny ourselves, but to take care of ourselves. Spa day. Now some of you have a spa day every day. You're burning candles all over, taking baths. You can't even function anymore. You know, there's thousands of people watching, I'm just saying. It's not you and me in our living room. All right, I'm going to move on. Um... It says our God is in heaven. This statement lets the whole world know that the true God is transcendent. Remember I said that word before? It's a fancy word. And all it means is he's high above the universe. And his being is apart from it. He's not like in the heavens like he made the heavens. If he made the heavens, which it says, and he's in the heavens, then where was he before he made the heavens? He chooses to live in the third heavens. But that's not where he started. He made it. He's beyond time, space, and matter. You can't wrap your mind around it. Stop trying to and just let God be God. The word kingdom, you're part of this kingdom. How many syllables in kingdom? And what are they made up of? Okay, you've got to choose which one you are going to be. There is only one king. I've met theologians, PhDs who are brilliant. 165 IQs, intelligent quotients. Brilliant. I did pretty good in school. I went to college on a scholastic scholarship. I'm not an idiot, but I consider it all dung. There's things I can't understand. I don't want to. I just want to hear God's voice. What, what transcendent means is he's surpassing. He's supreme and he's beyond space and time. Then it says, look at this. This is one verse. And you have in this one verse his, his transcendency 
and his sovereignty. It says he does whatever pleases him. That statement lets the whole world know that this true God of ours is sovereign. Another fancy word, another theological word, which means supreme rank, supreme power, and supreme authority. In other words, he answers to no one. How can he do that? Because he's sovereign. That's what makes him sovereign. That's what makes a person sovereign. There were countries that had monarchs. They were sovereign rulers. Whatever they said went. Whatever they said went. Look at Psalm 135.6. It says, Adonai, another word for the Lord in Hebrew, does whatever pleases him in heaven and on earth and in the seas. Not just in heaven. The other one said, I do what I want in heaven. He does what he wants on the earth. In the ocean. In all the depths. God is the universal sovereign. He's not just sovereign. He's universally sovereign. Divine sovereignty. It means that God is in fact not just a name only. It's not just theological. He's sovereign. That's the No. No, no, no. It's a fact. Not just a name. God is on the throne of the universe. He's directing all things. He's working in all things according to his will. When people take scripture out of context, I see these kids with t-shirts and making, I can do all things. Not if it's your will, you can't. Read the rest of the verse before it and behind it. If it's God's will, it's God's bill. But if it's your will, good luck. Good luck accomplishing it. Mm -mm. He does what he wants, when he wants, where he wants, how he wants, to whomever he wants. Harry Truman says, the buck stops here. I got news for you, Harry. The buck stops up in heaven at God's desk. Why? Because he's sovereign. Proverbs, the greatest book ever written in the universe on wisdom. 2130, it says this. No wisdom, no discernment, no counsel succeeds against Adonai. Man is powerless to outwit God in wisdom, understanding, and strategy. Guess what? No matter how long you live, I don't care how much money you spend on pearl cream, ladies. We're spending billions and billions of dollars on creams and lotions because we don't want a wrinkle. What am I going to say at your funeral? Here lies a lady with no wrinkles. When are you going to get it through your thick head? Stop living temporally. One out of one still dies. And on an eternal scale, it's a blip. Oh, if only they would, they, my mom would have been 80 next year. My mom would have been 85. My mom would have been 90. Gosh, she was two weeks away from being 95. It's a blip. Here today, gone tomorrow. Every purpose of the Lord shall be performed. How can he do that? Because he's sovereign. Daniel 4.35, the great king Nebuchadnezzar had to figure it out the hard way. He said, all who live on the earth are counted as nothing. This is a great king of a great king, the Babylonian kingdom. He's speaking about God. He says, he does whatever he wishes with the army of heaven. He's got an army behind him. And with those living on the earth, the army of the Lord. No one could call back his hand or ask him. You know, we say sometimes, if, what are you doing? You guys own a business, somebody comes in, what are you doing? They can say that at Burger King, right? What are, what are you doing? You can't go down the slide with shoes. It's rule number four. And we're like, ooh, 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 ooh. Johnny, I told you to take, and you're going to hit it. Take off your shoes. So we salute Burger the king, but we don't salute Jesus the king. You can't say to God, what are you doing? God, try it. Get mad at God. Shake your fist. We all do it. Go ahead. Have that work out for you, sweet pea. Did you get your way? No. Now you feel worse because you feel guilty because when he comes around and delivers you, you're like, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Like he didn't remember. Like, oh, I didn't really mean it. He just lets you have your little pity party, your craziness, and then, you know, he lets you move on. Let's you move on. Why? Because he's great. Look, we went to see a play. Remember that play I took you to in My Aunt Mary? Your arms are too short to box with God. I didn't even know what was going on. I don't think I had a relationship with God then. Patty LaBelle played the lead and, and Al Green played the other lead, right? And my Aunt Mary was like, what? what? Everybody in the audience was singing and dancing. Aunt Mary's like, what the heck is going on here? 
said, well, it's me. I don't know what's going on here. I just got tickets to a play. I want to take it. But that's what King Nebuchadnezzar found out. Your arms are too short to box with God. It won't work. He does what he wants. How can he do that? Because he's sovereign. The greatest prophet of all, Isaiah, look what he says in 46, 9, and 10. Remember things that happened at the beginning? This is God speaking. Long ago, that I am God, and there is none other. I am God, and there is none like me. At the beginning, I announced the end. It's all set up, kids. It's all done. It's all done. You might think, no, I can control this. Uh Uh-uh. You can't control nothing. No. And I say that my plan will hold. I will do everything as I please to do. God not only reveals events before they come to pass, but he has the ability to accomplish all his plans. How can he do that? He's sovereign. That's how. He's sovereign. Look at Romans 9, 13. Let me just get a zap. This accords with where it is written, Yaakov I love, but Esau I hated. This is where it's going to get a little rough. Now to further drive home God's sovereignty in Romans 9, I just gave you a little sidebar. Paul is quoting from Malachi. That's the quote from Malachi. Yeah, he's not detached from the prophets. I'll show you. Malachi 1, 2 through 3. It says, I love you, says Adonai. But you ask, how do you show us your love? Adonai answers, Esau was Jacob's brother. Yet I loved Jacob but hated Esau. I made his mountains desolate and gave his territory to desert jackals. That's what he did with the Edomites. Now that sounds rough, right? A little bit. I mean, come on, God. I know, you know, we all know you as loving and kind and compassionate. What do you mean, you know, Esau you hated? That's rough. I could just say, hey, I could, you know, you back me up to the corner. I say, God's sovereign. He does what he wants. But first of all, God is not speaking about people here. He's speaking about nations. He's speaking about Israel and Edom, of which Jacob and Esau were heads, okay? So if you, if you read it just like most unstable people who aren't taught how to study, I don't know how else to say it. I don't mean to be mean, but you're going to misunderstand it. And Satan is the author of confusion, so he doesn't want you to be wrong. Why do you think Satan didn't want people to have the Bible? People b- burned. John Huss died at the stake for getting the Bible in print, and you don't even open yours. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people died to keep it in print. It's crazy, man. What God is saying here through the prophet Malachi is that he marked out Israel as the nation to which he promised the Messiah and the Messianic kingdom. That's all. Doesn't mean he hated. He didn't. Esau had a pretty good life. Esau was blessed. You just got to understand the wording and the context. Edom didn't receive that promise. Edom wasn't going to be in the line of Messiah. No. In fact, he declared on Esau's descendants something different, like there would be a judgment. And why? Because they constantly, constantly fought Israel. Constantly. Now, this passage refers to earthly blessings, not eternal life. Again, it's it's a mistake. God's hatred of Edom doesn't mean that individual Edomites can't be saved. No, of course individual Edomites can be saved. Any more than his love for Israel means that individual Jews don't need to be saved. Everybody does. You follow? Edomite, Israelite, any otherite. So going back to 9.13 again, this sidebar into Malachi, I want you to know where it comes from. It says, this accords with where it is written, Yaakov I love, but Esau I hated. So the overall message here is that it's God's right to choose. Now this is where it gets a little dicey. It, It really does. Look at the next verse. It says, so are we to say it is unjust for God to do this? What is, what is Paul dealing with? He's dealing with objectors. We deal with objectors all the time. I think a lot of us are so tired of being objected that we don't share anymore. We don't know what to do. We're tired. We're tired. We're tired. It's like, look, I, I haven't really won that many souls. I've been trying and trying. They're not listening. So screw them. That's a bad approach. That's exactly what the enemy wants. Not what God wants. So the apostle here, Rob Shaul for you Hebraic folks, 
I'm Jewish, Rav Shaul, Rabbi Saul, the apostle, the emissary. Look, he's God's guy, okay? And he's anticipating that this teaching on God's sovereignty and God's sovereign choice is going to stir up all kinds of objections. He's, he's being proactive. So he's delivering a preemptive strike, which is wisdom personified. People are going to accuse God of unfairness, right? The unstable is going to go, what do you, what do you mean? He, he, he just said, you know what, Jacob, I'm, I'm going to go with you. Esau, I, I don't like you. That's rough. We don't like when people, um, what do we call it? Profile. Profile. We don't like it, right? We don't like it. So it's almost like God's just not even profiling. He's just haphazardly saying, but that's not exactly it. They will say if he chooses some, then he thereby damns the rest. This is what this fakakta, that's Yiddish for crazy, teaching on this John Calvin business. Like all of a sudden, John Calvin is the end all be all. Like for 1,500 years, we didn't know what we were doing until John Calvin came along. John Calvin had somebody killed because they went against him. Look it up. He was also a raging anti-Semite. So am I going to be a Calvinite? No, I'm going to be a Yeshuaite, not a Calvinite. So they'll argue that if God has settled everything in advance, then there's nothing anybody can do about it. That's what they say. And therefore, God is just unjust for condemning people. Right? You've heard it. You thought it. Well, you would think that from all the backlash Paul is going to get, he's going to backpedal. Because that's a lot what we do, right? All of a sudden we get a laugh. No, no, God loves you. He's love. He's love. I mean, that's the preaching of our day. I, I don't know why I did this. I never do this. But God just popped up a video of two guys on a blog. Last Sunday I watched it. Talking about the great preachers today. And the great preachers today are the guys that are growing. You know, 19,000 people. They started with 100 in a basement. Now they have 19,000. And I never listen to anybody else preaching except for God. I don't say that there's wrong. Some of you have preachers that you listen to. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm not. No way. Am I the only voice? You can get blessed by a lot of people. But I will tell you this. These guys were not preaching the gospel at all. You know what I saw that was consistent? Not only were they just motivational speakers, not only were they a lot of hoopla, and I got news for you. Take Linda, for example. If you go to some charismatic hoopla, tell me how that's going to work right now for you and Cal. It won't work. And let me tell you some sweet pea. The crap is about to hit the fan bigger than anybody's imagined, and it's not going to work. These people that are, that are standing on, on shaky ground are going to fall apart. Absolutely fall apart. And this is the common denominator I saw. Not, they, they, not only were they just, they were just, I'm telling you, they were absolutely, I'll tell you what they had in common. They were like talk show hosts, late night talk show hosts, uh, combined with news anchors and a little Sunday school teacher. That's what I saw. And they were missing what I call the three H's, which I always know when those three H's are missing, you don't have anybody preaching for God. Heaven, hell, and holiness. All three of those were missing consistently in all of them. Were they funny? <sighs> were they entertaining? Were they engaging? Were they cool? Were they hip? Were they now? Did they have videos? Oh, I, was, I would go there and have fun without a doubt. But no. No way. I mean, call yourself what you are. Say you're using some scripture and some proverbs to motivate people. But don't call yourself a minister of the gospel, please. There's 62 million people that have died for the gospel. Don't do that in their memory. That's just mm, no good, no good. So he's going to get a lot of objection, but he doesn't backpedal. I mean, you, you're familiar with Psalm 139? God, you knitted me in my mother's womb. You know me from afar. Where can I go from your presence? It's beautiful. It's very touching. When you read it, you could cry, right? Did you ever read the end of it? Or you just read that part? Because that's what we do today. We pick and choose what we like. Cafeteria Christianity. Oh, let me just show you a few verses. 139, 19 through 22. Check it out. God, if only you would kill off the wicked. Men of blood, get away from me. They invoke your name for their crafty schemes. That's what they're doing in those pulpits. Yes, your enemies misuse it. Yes, they do. I don't know how I hate those who hate you. 
God's not going to fill the seats or the baskets. Nobody wants to hear that part of it. I feel such disgust with those who defy you. All you need is love, love. Yeah, if your gospel is according to Ringo and John and George and Paul. I hate them with unlimited hatred. They have become my enemies too. While it is true that God is love, it is not the whole truth. God's love today is so overemphasized while his righteousness and holiness fades away. And before we condemn David in this psalm, condemn yourself because we pray the same thing when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. Because when he comes, he comes as judge. He's not coming to the wedding feast to just party. No, judgment first. Going back to 914. So are we to say it is unjust for God to do this? Heaven forbid. So instead of watering it down, instead of watering down God's sovereignty, instead of cowering to make it an easier pill for people to swallow, you familiar with that today? He proceeds to hammer it home all the more and harder and unapologetically, I might add. Look at Romans 9, 15. This is our last verse. It says, for the Moshe, he says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy on and I will pity whom I pity. Now, where is, he, where is this from? Exodus. Back in the Torah. It's crazy how much of Romans is in the Torah, is in the prophets, is in the Psalms. It's crazy. Look at Exodus 33, 19, so you know I'm not making this up. He replied, I will cause all my goodness to pass before you, and in your presence I will pronounce the name of Adonai. Moreover, I show favor to whomever I will, and I display mercy to whomever I will. So this was God's reply. Remember when Moses said, Show me your glory. I don't know if he got lost his mind. I don't know if he got to a point. I mean, he saw so much magnificence and supernatural power and so much deliverance and strength. But I think these two million people were getting to him. And I think he was ready to just give up. And he needed something. He needed a glimpse of God. You ever get to that point where you're ready to give up? And you're like, God, just talk to me. Just give me a sign. Show me so I don't care what it is. Drop a penny from heaven on head so I know that you're with me. I just need to know you're there. It's okay. We've all been there. Several, several times I'm there. It's okay. And if you're not there, then I give you the thumbs up. Good for you. Good for you. That's not me. So God's reply to Moshe's request to see his glory by promising to reveal himself as a God of grace and compassion. Going back to 915, who can say that the Most High... The Lord of heaven and earth does not have the right to show mercy and compassion to who he wants. How are you going to win that argument? Don't, don't, you got to start with the basics. This is a hard concept for people. It really is. I don't blame them for not understanding, but I can't water down truth. If I water it down, then it's not truth anymore. All people, that's all of us, all of us here, okay? All people are condemned by their own sin and unbelief. I know that sounds, no, that's not the God we want. Okay, so instead of God making you in his image, make God in your image. You can do it, but you're going to be surprised when you meet him. No one deserves to be saved. No one. You know, some of you are raised in the church, and you've always gone to church, and you've always gone to church, and you've always gone to church, and somehow you think you deserve it. That's crazy thinking that's very very dangerous guys i love you but it's dangerous if left to our own devices if left to my own devices i would be in hell tonight in in addition to extending the gospel invitation to all people which i think is pretty nice of god god chooses some of them some the exception every now and then some of these condemned people to be special objects of his grace jeremiah was called from the womb Not everybody's called from the womb. It's just the way it is. He can do that. He can choose. You know, I'm going to call you from the womb. You're going to be a special vessel for me. Because he made them. He's the creator. He can do that. But he doesn't do that with everybody. He doesn't say, yeah, yes, yes, no, 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 yes, yes, no. He doesn't do that. That's not true. It's an exception, not the rule. We are already condemned because we are lifelong sinners. 
And those who reject the gospel, it's on them. Those who have chosen can thank God for his grace, and those who have lost, who are lost, have no one to blame but themselves. And that's a rough truth. When we say God is sovereign, we are saying that he's in charge of the universe, and he could do as he pleases. We also know, according to the Bible, that God would never do anything wrong, unjust, or unrighteous. So to say that God is sovereign is just allowing God to be God. That's all it is. It's a glorious truth, and it causes us to worship. That's what makes you, you, me, me, and God, God. That's why people, like, sometimes you're so dependent on another person. You're like, I never thought you'd do this to me. They're not God. They're not God. I bet you never thought you'd do some funky stuff to other people too, but you did. The same Bible that teaches God's sovereignty is the same Bible that teaches human responsibility. While it's true, and this is coming from a guy who's preached like, he was preaching, he, pre he preached, Billy Abney preached to Methuselah. I know that for a fact. All right, I have, I have the, I kid, because I kid, because laughter is my medication. That's, because if I don't laugh, then I'll cry all the time. Really, so forgive me, forgive me for the sarcasm, forgive me, but there's my, I have more respect for Billy than you would ever know in a gazillion years, in a gazillion years. He has been a staunch supporter of Bernadette and I um, since we got here. Um, he told me that he was praying for a messianic synagogue for years. He has encouraged me more than he would ever know. There were times I was so ready to stop and quit and throw in the towel when he showed up at my office and God sent him. So I can kid with him. And I tell you this all the time. If I don't kid with you and I'm serious all the time, it means I don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're sitting there go, he's serious with me all the time. Okay, what is, it's true, God, guys, it is true that God elects some people to salvation, but it's also true that they must choose to be saved by a definite act of their will. He can't just say, hey, I'm going to save you. No, you have to choose it. In other words, this equation we call the salvation equation, there's a divine side and a human side. But, but, but how can God choose individuals to belong to himself and at the same time make a bona fide offer of salvation to all people everywhere? How can we reconcile these truths? We can't. The fact is we can't. To the human mind, they're in conflict. But the Bible teaches both doctrines, and therefore we have to believe both. Content to know that the difficulty lies in our own minds and not in God's. These two truths are like two parallel lines that will only meet in eternity. To the man who is saved, the subject of God's sovereign choice should be the cause of unending wonder. I don't know if, you, I don't know if you've done this, but I did this at least the first 10 years of my walk. The believer looks around and sees people with better characters, better personalities, and better dispositions than his own, and asks, why me? Why'd you choose me? So many years I asked that question. Because I, I met so many people that weren't saved that were so much better and kinder than me. The truth of election should not be used by the unsaved for excusing their unbelief. They must not say, if I'm not chosen, then there's nothing I can do about it. The only way you could ever know if you are chosen is by repenting of your sins and receiving Messiah Yeshua as Savior. I offer you that today. Let's find out if you're chosen. If you're willing to repent and do the human side of things, guess what? You're chosen. You don't have to run up here. You don't have to go some place. Well, I'm, I'm embarrassed. Well, if they're not willing to acknowledge me before people, they're brand new. Lighten up. Some of you have been saved 30 years. You're not willing to acknowledge them before people. If you want to do that, I'm available anytime, any day. Anytime, any day, you want somebody to pray with you about repenting of your sins, and I am available. Not available 24-7 to hear about your cockamamie dreams you had when you were five, but I am available for salvation. 
So you can't say, well, if I'm not chosen, there's nothing I can do about it. Neither should the truth of election be used by believers to excuse their lack of evangelistic zeal. See how dangerous this is? This is buried churches. It's, it's breaking up the Southern Baptist Convention. We must not say, well, they'll be saved anyway. It's not feel the dreams. If you build it, they will come. No, no. If you build a church, they will not come. You've got to go out and get them. You don't fish inside a building. That much I do know. We are commanded to preach the gospel. We're not commanded for the results. Stop thinking worldly. Well, Rabbi, I've preached it all year and I didn't save anybody. First of all, you can't save nobody. Okay, let's end things. Whoa! That's true? Really? Lizzie, I used to go to 3 o'clock and then sit in that parking lot because you guys would sit on the floor of the parking lot and keep me there till 6. And then I would go home and ask Bernadette, did you make a hemlock quiche? Because I just want to kill myself. <laughs> okay, I'm going to wrap it up. Here's the takeaway for yours truly. I can tell you this. They say that you can't, you, can't, you can't grab people for more than 20 minutes today. They say it's impossible. Nobody has that ability. God has that ability. Okay, let's finish it, okay? Number one. God can elect this for yours truly. I never give you my opinion, but here goes. God can elect anyone he wants, but guess what? I'm going to nominate everyone. Sadly enough, evangelism is becoming as extinct as the dodo bird. There is the time more than ever. This is the time more than ever to shine our light and spread our salt. Trust me. Now more than ever. Number two, God says, I call on heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have presented you with life and death the blessing and the curse. Therefore, choose life so that you will live. So as far as predestination is concerned, my take is this. Your destination is predetermined by your choice. Number three, Yeshua taught a parable about the wedding feast where he likened the kingdom of heaven to a certain king who prepared a marriage feast for his son. There was an original guest list, huge, but it was scrapped because no one responded. So he sent out a general invitation to all who would come. Our Lord concluded the parable with the words, many are called, but few are chosen. All who respond to the good news are then chosen. The invitation is out there. RSVP, that's up to you. Number four, and another note regarding many are called and few are chosen. What I see today is that many are cold and few are frozen. I believe in this last days, it's time for some of us to defrost ourselves and get a little fired up. Last but definitely not least, I'd just like to say if you are saved, then get on your knees and thank your master. And if you are not saved, then get on your knees and meet your master. Let's stand together. You're here for the first time and you're saying, I think he struggles with mental illness you might not be a psychiatrist but you're on the road yeah um look god speaks he does his thing i'm kind of a ventriloquist dummy but please i can't begin to tell you in words how much i love you and care about you every single one of you that i know are going through stuff those that i'm aware of it hurts I'm not texting Linda late last night because I'm showing my neighbor, I'm a good rabbi, I'm a good pastor. I don't play that game. I'm, I'm going to be real. I care. It's, it's, it hurts to see people in pain that you care about and know what they're going through because you went through it. So don't make the mistake because I might rant and rave in, in the name of Yeshua that I don't care. Don't do that. Please don't do that. You know, Because Bern and I and our family, we've had 19 years and we put our heart and soul into everything we did here. And we will continue to do that until God says it's time. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the principle of peace, Yeshua. Be a semlecha shalom.
Blessings, guys. Love you. Peace.